to Lynn playing, and, and that's such love. And here we are, that, thank you, Liz, here we are that, that Sunday after the glorious Easter Sunday, and we're thinking, aren't we, this morning about that such love and the love that Jesus actually brought when he came to the earth and he's here now by his Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to ask us just to just bring ourselves into this space, all that chatter, let it just, just empty your mind of all that stuff that might have even kept you thinking about coming here this morning, but you are here, and allow God to show you his such love. Let's do that in a moment's quiet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for joining us here at St. Paul's as we celebrate the risen Jesus. And we've got a beautiful song to listen to. I will allow you to mime it behind your masks. Please don't sing. Thank you, Lynn. we join together in worship. Shall we share this opening prayer together as we hold a moment's silence, as we bring who we are and all that we will be to our almighty God. Give us now a sense of your presence. Lord, as we bring our prayers and requests to you, enable us to open our hearts and our minds to you. We come to that part in our service now where we're going to bring our sorries to God. So let us confess our sins 
to God and ask for his forgiveness for all the wrong things we have done. In your mercy, forgive us, Lord. For forgetting what we ought to have remembered, for failing to do as we have promised, for turning away when we should have listened, for being careless when we should have been diligent. In your mercy, forgive us, Lord. For doing things we knew would annoy you, for acting in ways we knew would hurt, for behaving in ways we knew would disappoint. Together, in your mercy, forgive us, Lord. O oh God, when we look back, we can see how foolish and wrong we have been. Forgive us and help us not to do the same things again. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are a forgiven people and we receive God's forgiveness. May the God who loved the world so much that he sent his son to be our saviour forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as God's forgiven people, we stand on the rock of our faith, Jesus, confident that we are a forgiven people because we continue to walk in faith and hope. Amen. And Rod's going to read to us the two readings to us, and then he'll bring us God's word. Thank you, Rod. Good morning. Father God, as we look into your word this morning, we pray that you will open up our hearts and minds to the things that you want to speak to us by your Holy Spirit, that we may grow to be the people that we should be, the people you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 133, first of all. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It's as if the dew of Mount Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Our second reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 4. And uh, in some ways this is uh, related to the first reading. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them, all that, all that there were, sorry, all that there were, no needy persons among them. It doesn't seem to read right, but you get the sense there wasn't any needy people among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, bought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Okay, so... 
the readings I've chosen for today are about unity in the family of God. The psalm talks about the overwhelming joy that is felt when people dwell in that place. And the reading from Acts illustrates what can happen when there is a unity of heart and mind in the church. Some Christians say that the church should get back to what it was like right at the start. And as we read the book of Acts, we could well agree. However, of itself, the church has never been perfect. It's only the grace of God and the work of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit that has caused the church to grow to the phenomenal size that it is today. Incidentally, uh, some research by Boston University in the, UNIS in the USA last year estimated that there were about 2.6 billion adherents to the Christian faith in the world today. The largest religious group worldwide that's 31% of the world's population. Of course, this includes people who were nominally Christian, people who would say that they were Christian, but do not really have Jesus in their hearts. But my point is that we should never, ever think that the church is dying. One of my favourite quotes of Jesus from the Gospel of Matthew Peter had just told Jesus that he believes that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, Peter, and Peter's name means a stone or a piece of rock, and on this rock, and that's the rock of Peter's confession of who Jesus is, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus will continue to build his church until the time is right for his return. And it will not be to a church that's downtrodden and in defeat. It will be for a church that is triumphant, adorned, like a bride made perfect. Anyway, I digress a little. I get a bit excited when I think that Jesus can take someone like me wash me, clothe me in his righteousness, and call me beloved of God. So, first of all, Psalm 133, a psalm of ascents. Songs of joy that the Israelites sang as they approached the temple on the days of the great feasts, especially so after their years in exile, when it had not been possible to visit the temple, and the temple had been in ruins. Their joy is the unity of God's people, one with God and one with each other. I wonder, do we share that joy? Are you glad to be back in church with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Is it a delight to worship together? Your answer should be yes to those questions. If not, you will need to examine your relationship with God and your rela relationship with one another. Unity in the church is essential, but like ripples on a lake, it should spread further into our homes, our communities, our places of work, our cities, our countries, and even to the ends of the earth. There is certainly no room in the church for racism, for prejudice, hate, and certainly not petty disagreements. We're all called to be beacons of God's standards, it's good and pleasant when all people live together in unity. In fact, it's so good that it's like experiencing extravagance. The precious oil that the psalmist talks about is a perfume made only for the priests. Its recipe is found in the book of Exodus. Fragrant spices, gum, resin, onkia and galabon and pure frankincense, all in equal amounts. And make a fragrant blend of incense, the work of a perfumer. It's to be salted and pure and sacred. Now, Imperial Majesty, uh, which uh, was the world's most expensive perfume, named in the Guinness Book of Records, uh, was priced at $2,355 per ounce. To a Jew, it was more exclusive and more valuable than that. 
You might think that something so precious would be used sparingly, but no. God orders that the precious oil not be dabbed on the forehead with a fingertip, but poured over the priest's head, running down over his forehead, his face, round his ears, and down his neck and beard. This was how God wanted, to, uh, wanted his priest to be treated. And guess what? We, as Christians, as the Apostle Peter said, are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You are special. God loves you. He wants the very best for you. Jesus gave his life for you. Live your life in this reality. Guard your unity with one another because it's precious. You're so precious. The second part of the psalm is a reinforcement of the first. It's about extravagance again. When people are in unity, it's like the morning dew that falls on Mount Hermon, uh, a mountain that is in the Golan Heights of Israel, and it stands 9,232 feet above sea level. To give you some idea of the size, Mount Snowdon in Wales is a mere 3,560 feet, just over a third. Mount Zion, on the other hand, which is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, is only 2,510 feet. Consider then, if the dew from Mount Hermon fell on Jerusalem, it would swamp it. Unity is so overwhelmingly good for the church and indeed the whole planet. And wherever God sees it, he blesses it. And you will be blessed. I will be blessed when you and I work on our own attitudes and seek to lead others into the ways of unity. Just to say that unity isn't uniformity. Unity is allowing others to hold differing opinions without allowing it to mar our relationships. Yes, we do need to speak out against wrongdoing, but remember, whoops, <laughs> but remember uh, that Jesus condemned sin, but never the sinner, and he hated hypocrisy. There will be a day of judgment, and God himself will decide who, apart from the person with Jesus in their heart, is going to be saved. Luke, the Gospel writer, who also wrote the book of Acts, gives a good example of Christian unity within the church. He talks about them having one heart and mind. Their hearts are their feelings. Not just the fuzzy warmth towards each other, but how they react, even when they're sorely tested. The heart can be a kind of all sorts of pettiness, uh, jealousy and envy. The Gospel writer Matthew says, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adulter, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, and false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. Our hearts are something that we can work on when we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, whom Christ caused to dwell in us when we asked him to come into our lives, to be our saviour. We can reject his guidance and we can choose to disobey what we know to be right. But what sort of behaviour is that for someone who has been liberated by a willing, the willing death of a saviour? We're all a work in progress. But it's within every one of us uh, the will to be holy, to have a heart for God and to seek lives pleasing to God. In our reading, Luke spoke of them being of one heart and mind. The authorised version of the Bible talks of being of one heart and one soul. The soul being the very breath that God breathed into mankind at creation. Our soul is who we are, our personality. The heart and soul of this first church was to be generous, to share. They were expecting to Jesus they were expecting Jesus to come back imminently. So what, was, uh, what good was it to hold on to possessions? What good was surplus? 
even if you were never going to need it. 2,000 years later, even though Christ could come back at any time, we don't feel that same imminence. That part of our faith has waned and we are more into uh, to self-preservation. Uh, in the West, we've grown fat and largely selfish and sadly, even the Christian church can be subject to looking after number one. Nevertheless, Luke has given us some principles that we can follow that will allow, allow the grace of God, that is for us, his undeserved favour, uh, to work powerfully in us all. So firstly, we need to testify to the resurrection of Jesus. The Apostle Paul said, and if Christ had not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Let us never be ashamed to admit that we have faith in the resurrected Jesus Christ. Next, we need to be aware of those in need, especially in the church. A young Christian care worker, uh, young in faith that is, was bowled over when she mentioned to her mother that one of her clients had been given a new home and that among other things, she needed some long curtains. Her mum said that she would mention it in a home group, online home group that is. No one in the group could help, uh, could help out, but a few days later, um, her mum got a phone call from one of the church leaders. We have a fund at church, money set aside to help people in need. We'd like to buy some brand new curtains for the person who needs them. Wow, what a testimony to that church. What a good example of 21st century Christianity at work. We should all agree with God with what we're going to give to the church, and many people do give a tithe or a tenth of their income. And they give aid it where, where that's possible. But what about separately contributing to a fund so that collectively we can help others in need? The Bible talks about tithes and offerings. The parish share is necessary to pay for clergy across the diocese and also for the maintenance of the building but we could give something in addition uh, to our regular giving. And who knows, we might need help someday. However, I do acknowledge those of you who, are, who have given generously, uh, for example, the fixing of our west window and to the new boiler, which we're getting the benefit of even today. And there are many more offerings that few people will ever know about and I'm sure God will bless you. Next, the, uh, the people brought their offerings to the apostles' feet. They trusted the church leadership to distribute, distribute the money where it was needed. There are two messages here. First, there is an issue of trust. Our giving should never be conditional on how it's used. Once we have agreed with the Lord how much we are going to give, we give it with no conditions attached, unless it's an extra offering given for a specific project. And uh, I believe we might have one or two more coming up. Secondly, there is a duty of the leadership to use tithes and offerings in an honorable way, and not to be used frivolously for vanity projects. Uh, some of you may hate computers and, and consider those a vanity project. Uh, but in this day and age, they're a very necessary tool in the church's ministry. And, uh, and I, I can testify that Wendy's ministry is greatly blessed and benefited by the use of computers. My last point is this. Joseph from Cyprus, his name, jo the name Joseph means he will add, was named Barnabas by the uh, apostles and as the passage tells us, his new name meant a son of encouragement. How can we be like this follower who is mentioned by name and remembered for all time? What, what do we add to the church by way of our finance, our time, our skills, our energy, our fervent prayers, our love for one another, and of course, our unity? 
And lastly, how can we be looked upon by the church leader as encouragers in the faith? There's a great correlation between unity and faith, and we can all encourage one another by the giving of ourselves in unity. Amen. to God. Heavenly Father, we bring ourselves before you. Please stand among us. Guide us by your Holy Spirit. And bring us together, one mind, one heart, as we move forward in unity. Bind us together, Lord. And this morning we pray for your world places that are war-torn, in conflict, and in a moment's silence, we can lift a, a place that is on our hearts this morning. We pray for all the leaders of all the nations all over the world that they will look to you and not to their own self-serving, that they would turn their face and their service to you, Lord, and move together, one heart, one mind, Join, join them together in unity. Lord, we pray for your church. This church here, St. Paul's, as we pray for that new way forward in a new normal and what that might look like for us. We pray for your church worldwide and all the leaders. 
we bring them to you this morning. Ask you to greatly bless them. Help them too to work together in one mind, one heart. Bind them together in your love. We thank you, Lord, for all that has gone before in this community. We thank you for the involvement of this church in this community. And as we join together in unity, become one heart and one mind, bringing our gifts. for new ways to connect, new ways, Lord, to work with people. Lord, bring us together in unity so that we may serve our community and make your name known in this place. Bind us together, Lord. We pray for all those who have been poorly in body, mind, or spirit. And again, a moment's pause as we bring those people before the Lord. Pray for your healing hand to be on all those. Help them to feel you near and know your healing touch. Pray for all those who have died, those from the terrible COVID virus and all those that have died in different circumstances. We pray particularly for our royal family this morning, mourning the death of Prince Philip. We hold them before you and we ask that you will, Lord, be with them. We thank you for Queen Elizabeth's faith. We thank you for the position she holds. We ask that you would comfort her and the rest of the family in her sorrow. And Lord, we pray for all those who mourn. Help them to be bound together in your love. Hold them in your everlasting arms that they may know your comfort and in time, your peace. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together in cords that cannot be broken. Help us to build on your name, on you, the rock of our salvation. Build us up. 
make us too sons and daughters of encouragement for those we meet on a daily basis. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together. Our collect for this second Sunday of Easter. Risen Christ, for whom no door is locked, no entrance barred. Open the doors of our hearts that we may seek the good of others and walk the joyful road of sacrifice and peace. To the praise of God the Father. Amen. As we think of those words and the prayers that we have been part of, we bind all those prayers together as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we move on prayerfully, I hope, to our notices. Um, if you would like to join the PCC, you have to be on the electoral roll and those forms will have been around for you to fill in. The, for the moment, the electoral, for, uh, electoral roll, um, I think the word is suspended until after the APCM. So you might like to pray and ponder that if you're not part of that roll. There is also a notice going up this morning about our annual parochial council meeting, our AGM, our yearly AGM, which is on the 29th of April uh, at seven o'clock, which will be here in church and also it will be on Zoom as well for those who yet don't feel comfortable in coming into the building or are still shielding. So that's the 29th of April. Having heard God's word this morning through Rod, there may be a little nudge for you. We are seeking another church warden, as you all know, Chris Tetley. All of the Tetleys are going on placement to St. Mark's in Woodborough, and we wish them well, and we pray them on their way. Chris is, uh, he is seeking um, to see whether God is calling him to ordination. So he's not on that path yet. It's a bit of a time before that where uh, alongside Matt Roberts and other people, he'll be um, streamed into uh, giving his thoughts and other people will give their thoughts, but they're not going to be with us uh, for the next year. So we are in need these of a church warden and of course those of you who are part of the PCC will know that Sue Tetley was our safeguarding officer and we're also seeking a safeguarding officer as well. So that's church warden and safeguarding officer. Maybe this is how you become part of the church because we need to have a role, don't we? 
because we're in this together. We work with God. So we're going to go forward thinking about what we can do with God, God leading the way, of course. So if you've got that nudge and you feel you've got some safeguarding skills or church warden skills, gifting, then please do see me or Pat or one of the team afterwards. We'd be delighted to hear from you. I think that's all the notices, unless someone's going to raise their hands and tell me anything different. That's what we're working towards at the moment, that APCM, that AGM. As we just let that dwell within us, we ask for God's blessing upon us this morning. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and all those that you maybe still cannot see at this moment in time. The Lord be gracious to you and bring you his peace. And we ask for this blessing in the name of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and to think about how you can serve the Lord. Amen.